Hello, uh, thanks for taking the time to watch this video of my talk. It's called Achieving Inclusivity Through Remote Work, and it's part of RailsConf Couch 2020. Uh, so thanks for inviting me into your living room. It's very cozy, like what you've done with the place. And I hope that you're sitting on a very comfy couch wearing your comfiest pajamas as you watch this video. I am wearing my pajamas as I am recording it for you. So. I just want to start out uh, by briefly introducing myself. My name is Jamison Hampton. Uh, you can call me Jamie. I'm from Buffalo, New York, the home of bad sports. Uh, I actually always start out my talks with that joke, but right now there are no sports, so actually we are all tied, I would say, at the moment. Uh, I'm coming to you from Buffalo, New York, where I am currently in quarantine, um, but doing reasonably okay. I'm representing Greater Than Code. That's the podcast that I'm a panelist on. If you haven't checked it out, I recommend that you do. I think it's a really good show. We talk a lot about tech, um, but kind of through the lens of, well, who are the people behind the tech and what's the story of their lives that kind of got them to that point? Uh, I'm not re representing a company right now, uh, and job hunting during the pandemic is actually not that fun. So if you are hiring and you might be interested in hiring, a Rails developer or a DevRel person, please reach out to me. In fact, you can find me on Twitter at Jamie Bash. That's my username at most places. Um, and even if you're not hiring, please feel free to find me on Twitter, uh, add me as a friend, send me memes, talk to me on Twitter. I'm at home and bored. Um, the only thing I ask is if you talk about me or my talk publicly, which you're very welcome to do, just keep in mind that I use they, them pronouns. Thanks. Uh, so I'm going to talk about remote work, which is actually a topic that is very topical right now, I would say. Um, this is some statistics that I'm starting out with from the Stack Overflow Developers Survey in 2019, asking people how often they work remotely. Uh, so as you can see, there is quite um, a big percentage in 2019 that doesn't uh, work remote at all. Although I would be interested to see the statistics for 2020 because I think they're going to look a lot different now that pretty much everyone is working remote all of a sudden, um, which I will talk about more later. But as you can see here, even in 2019, uh, about 12% of people reported being full-time remote uh, tech workers. Uh, additionally, in the 2017 Stack Overflow Developer Survey, they asked about priorities when looking for a new job and considering offers, and 53% of people said that remote options were a top priority to them. So obviously this is something that's important to people and something that people are thinking about. Uh, so personally, I've been working remote, I've been working 80 to 100% remote for uh, my entire career, about seven years, and when I tell people this, we usually have a conversation that goes a little bit like this. Uh, I've had this conversation and variations of it many times, and so have many other people that work remote, which I know from working with many remote people. And um, I've also found that these responses tend to annoy people that work uh, full-time remote. Um, because I get that, you know, people who have never worked remote before sometimes will act like it's kind of a walk in the park or not like as hard as a real job. Um, and it's not like that. It's still a job. You still have to get just as much done. Um, in fact, I feel more guilty about taking breaks or whatever when I'm working from home than when I'm in an office because water cooler chat kind of stuff like happens naturally in offices. Um, and additionally, it can be isolating not having that kind of chat throughout the day. And this is a uh, from an oatmeal article about it does like the pros and cons of remote work. It's pretty funny. Um, but this one kind of speaks to me. Like after I've been working from home and not, um, sometimes I won't get out of my house, even before I was stuck in my house. Um, and so that kind of resonates with me and probably a lot of people that work remote. But ultimately, my response is usually something more like this. Like, it's awesome. I know, right? I'm wearing my PJs right now. It rules. I wish more people had the opportunity to do remote work. Um, that one, the last one is a bit of a monkey's paw, I have to admit. Um, this is not the situation that I envisioned for everyone getting a chance to work remote. Um, but I do love working remote. Um, it really works for me. It's an awesome situation for me, and it helps me do my best work. And a lot of people are in the same boat as me. So I really want to talk about why that is. And I think, like, a good place to start 
it's just the general benefits of remote work um, for anybody. You're going to see a lot of these things on any kind of article you read about remote work. And like flexibility is a huge one for tons of people. And remote jobs often have more flexibility even on hours. Um, you know, maybe you want to start a little bit earlier, or a little bit later. That's normally fine. Um, maybe you have things during the day you have to do at a specific time, like you have to pick up your kids from daycare. Um, it's easier to work around things like that. Uh, obviously, there's no commute. This is a big one for a lot of people. Some people have a really long commute, and this is a huge perk. Uh, for me in Buffalo, this is a pretty big one for me also um, because A, we don't have public transportation really very well in Buffalo, and B, we have bad weather for a lot of the year, so I don't have to dig my car out of the snow or anything like that. The freedom from, to work from anywhere is pretty cool. Uh, I used to do a lot of traveling when I can. Um, sure, I will be doing it again at the point where I can, doing a lot of conferences, going places, visiting people, visiting family. Um, I often visit my family in Texas, and it was it's really nice to be able to work while I'm there in Texas instead of taking PTO. I can work during the day and see my family in the evening. Uh, better productivity. I think your mileage may vary a little bit with this one. Um, some people find it difficult to work from home and not get distracted by home things like the dishes and the laundry. Um, also, right now, this one's out the window. Nobody is having good productivity because of reasons, uh, pandemic reasons, that I will talk a little bit more about later. But in general, for a lot of people, um, they find that they have better productivity working from home because you can have longer periods of like uninterrupted focus time, less interruptions uh, from colleagues and such like this. And I mean, the comfort of working from a space that you're comfortable in can't be understated. You do your best work when you're comfortable and you have a lot of control over your home office. So obviously those were all benefits. Um, that list was kind of in general for everybody. And the word benefits is interesting. This is um, a definition. I read a lot of definitions of it, actually. Uh, but I liked this one. I like promotes well-being as a phrase. I think that's good. Um, the word advantageous or advantage came up in a lot of uh, the definitions I read also. Um, but I think it can kind of mean two different things, which is what I get at when I say I think it's interesting. Some benefits are like perks. They're nice to have. They make your life a little bit better to have a little bit more flexibility to not have to do the commute. Um, but there's also people for whom remote work is more than just a little extra convenience. And some benefits are things that you really need to make it possible to do a job that would have been very difficult otherwise. Um, so it's, it's cool to think about what benefits you want to give people, um, but I think it's like more helpful or more important to think about like what problems or barriers people might be having that you could help solve using remote work. Um, and with that in mind, I'm going to talk for a couple of minutes about diversity and inclusion. Um, because what benefits are really valuable to people, it's going to be different for different people. And it's going to be different for different demographics, too. Um, so why strive for a diverse team? I think ultimately it's just the right thing to do. Um, and I think that's the motivation for a lot of people, which is great. You know, it's the right thing to do, not to pass up people um, for a job because they look different from you. Um, but also in addition to that, it makes your team stronger and that's like really true and in concrete ways. First of all, having different perspectives represented on your team makes you better at anticipating problems. Um, I actually do a whole talk about having how to have empathy for users that are from like a very different demographic than you, but it's tough. Um, we're not very great at anticipating the needs for people who have like different needs than us. So having lots of people on your team who have different needs from each other um, like kind of spreads that out. Uh, an interesting example that I like to tell the story of is a story about a team that was working on the early automated hand dryers, like the ones where you put your hands under and it just turns on. And they put this product out and it went out into like bathrooms and they found then, too late, that it didn't really work well for black people because the their product wasn't very good at detecting black skin as opposed to white skin. Uh, so obviously that was embarrassing, but I think the most embarrassing part about it is that like they didn't think of it, but it's also very indicative that they didn't have any black people working with their team because if there was a black person, even one black person, 
involved in any step of the process, they would have super noticed that and they didn't notice it. So you can tell that they didn't have a diverse team. Um, and also you're just going to land talented people, um, maybe who are overlooked by other companies because the tech industry kind of has a diversity problem in general. There's a lot of people hiring for culture fit, just like hiring people that are just like everyone else on their team already. And like, not only does that make their team bad because they don't have these different perspectives, um, but it also means that they're not getting the best candidates because they're only considering like a narrow segment of the population. So like, you want to hire those candidates. I also want to talk real briefly about diversity versus inclusion. Um, this is a thing that a lot of people talk about in tech, I think, which is good. Um, but diversity is kind of what I was talking about there, like having a team that doesn't all look the same, people from different backgrounds. But inclusion is more than that. It's making those people feel comfortable, welcome, and integrated on your team. Um, here's kind of a drawing. I don't like the way the arrows are pointing in this drawing, so ignore that. But on the left here, you kind of have diversity. Like there's different people that aren't the same, but they're kind of segmented and they're not integrated with each other. And then like on the right, it's more like inclusion because everyone's integrated into one team. But diversity without inclusion um, actually alienates un underrepresented people on your team. It kind of indicates that you care more about having an about us section on your website that looks good with like diverse people on it um, than you care about actually supporting your employees. And that will lead to less diversity over time because underrepresented people aren't going to want to stay at your company. Uh, but on the other hand, inclusion fuels diversity because then you are going to retain those people and you're going to attract even more diverse candidates um, because underrepresented people talk to each other and find out what companies are good at this and then go to work for those companies. So I want to talk about a few kind of different demographics of people. Um, I can't cover all of them. In fact, I'm going to talk about chronic illness and disability first. And there are tons of different kinds of chronic illness and disability um, that have different symptoms, different challenges, different needs. So this is pretty general, um, but I am, I do want to disclose that I struggle with pretty severe anxiety disorder, um, and I'm going to talk about that. It's a big part of why working from home is like pretty critical for me and has really improved my life. So I'm going to talk about my perspective for that. Uh, first of all, lots of different people have different accessibility accommodations. There's, like I said, there's a lot of different types of disabilities. Um, and it's likely that the best accessibility that people are going to find is like at their own house where they can control all of those variables. And like a lot of illness makes it hard to leave the house at all, like some or even most of the time. Um, personally, before I was fully remote, I used to miss a ton of work um, because there were days when I feel too bad to like really get out of bed and I would have to call in. Um, but it doesn't actually mean that I can't work sometimes. Um, so actually, I, sometimes it's really helpful to be able to work because it takes my mind off whatever anxiety thing I'm going through. Um, so that's a huge advantage for me. And related to that is that flexible working hours are a perk for anybody, but some people really have a tangible need for them more. Um, for instance, like there are days when I'll have a panic attack early in the morning, which is really tough, and I kind of just need to go back to bed for a couple of hours to be functional at all. And so if I can start a little bit late and then work a little bit late, um, that's like a whole day that I'm working that I would have had to call out otherwise, which I used to have to do. And also um, people who have a lot of doctor's appointments need more flexibility for that. And that's a big thing too for a lot of people. Um, when I talk about energy conservation, I really like to use this metaphor of spoon theory. Uh, I actually did an entire talk about spoon theory that I will link at the end of this because I talk about a lot of really related stuff about some of these demographics. Um, but spoon theory essentially is the idea that everyone has a finite amount of energy that they can use in a day. And so the spoons are kind of these metaphorical units of energy that you spend on doing things. Um, so people with chronic illness often have to really think about how much energy they're going to have and what they can get done with that amount of energy and kind of ration it. And so getting to the office, you know, getting up, getting ready, commuting, getting to a building and like settling in can take a lot of energy for some people. And so if you don't have to do any of those steps, being able to start the day off like fresh with all of your spoons is like big. 
And you know, people want to keep their health issues private, naturally. Um, lots of people who struggle with illness have like good days and bad days. And maybe you just don't want people to see you on the bad days. For me, that means, you know, if I have a panic attack at home, um, it sucks and it's rough for me, but I'll get through it. But if I have a panic attack at work, it's really awful and embarrassing for me and it follows me around in a different way. Um, so just not having to turn on the camera if you're having a bad day preserves like a lot of privacy for people. I'm also going to talk about the idea of being an underrepresented minority at your job. Um, again, there's tons of different kinds of ways that you could be underrepresented. Um, and I'm not going to talk right now about specific ones, but there are some things that I think anyone, if they're not part of the majority group, kind of deals with. And energy conservation is one of them again. Uh, Spoon Theory was really designed to talk about illness primarily, um, but I do think that underrepresented people have to use more energy at work for reasons like these ones. Um, code switching is basically the idea that the way you act and talk is different when you're with different kinds of groups of people and it takes mental energy um, to switch between them. So we talk about bringing your whole self to work, which is nice, um, but actually most people really don't because naturally the way you talk to your coworkers is different than the way you talk to like your friends. And that might be much more true if you're not part of like this majority in-group. Um, it might mean that like the slang you'd use with your friends who are in the same ethnic group as you is very different from, than how you talk from work. Uh, for me, I talk very different around a group of all queer people. I'm more open about certain things. Um, so there's an energy cost associated with like the mental calculations of that. Uh, microaggressions are another thing that you could do a whole talk on. Um, but it's basically this idea that like small, indirect, often unintentional, discriminations or comments against minority groups like happen in the office even if you're trying to avoid them it's just a thing that happens um, this might be things like off-color jokes uh, making assumptions about people uh, for me an example that's really big is like when I'm getting misgendered um, it's tiring for me and so these are small but they like add up and they take energy and it can make people feel like an outsider in lots of ways. Um, someone once told me a story about working at a series of jobs where they were the only Latino at like any of their jobs and they always felt like none of their coworkers really understood them. And then they worked at a place that was fully remote for the first time and had people all over the world. And for the first time they were like, oh, I don't feel like I stick out because everyone on this team is different from each other. And that was like a good feeling for them. Uh, resources can be an issue too. Again, this could affect um, a lot of different kinds of people, but I think disproportionately underrepresented people who might come from like underprivileged backgrounds. It can be really expensive to work. Um, think about someone who just like did a boot camp, they come from an underprivileged background, and they're looking for their first tech job. You know, maybe they can't afford a nice wardrobe yet to dress business casual at an office. Maybe they can't afford to go out to lunch with their coworkers and it makes them feel left out. Maybe even like affording transportation to and from work uh, can be an issue. It's like, and that's really stressful and difficult. And it leads me into like the next thing I wanna talk about too, which is location-based diversity, which I think is really important and sometimes overlooked when we have this discussion. You know, people who come from different places or live in different places or have different backgrounds or cultures have different perspectives, as I said earlier, that's gonna make your team better, stronger, more thoughtful. And one of the big factors is that is that not everyone has the resources to live in major urban areas where a lot of tech jobs are. Um, maybe they can't afford it. It's extremely expensive to live in New York City or San Francisco. Maybe they have family obligations, um, people, older people that they're taking care of in their family. Maybe they're from a culture where like being close to your family is, is really valued and they, they don't feel like they can move away. Maybe they have visa issues. Um, if you want people from like different countries on your team, I think that brings a ton of really good perspective, um, but it can bring a whole kind of host of issues in itself. Um, and these also are just factors that may disproportionately affect underrepresented minorities. Um, a lot of people have underprivileged backgrounds, different cultures, being from different places, different countries, which is all cool. Uh, I think it's really cool, but it, brings up a lot of these issues specifically. 
I'm also going to talk, I want to kind of focus specifically on the trans community as like one segment of what I've just been talking about. Um, and the reasons that I kind of want to focus on it are, I'm trans, um, so talk about what you know, and talk about what's important to you, and this is really important to me. Um, I think the, the number of trans people working in tech has been growing a lot, um, and that means the likelihood that you are or you will be working with like a trans coworker on your team is also growing a lot. And so understanding the, the perspective will help you work more effectively with your coworkers and respectfully, actually. Also, I believe that the reason that there's more trans people working in tech now is because remote work is a thing that's possible in tech. And remote jobs can be really attractive for tra to trans people for like unique reasons. Um, so what are those reasons? Transitioning is hard in general. Um, it's a huge change in one's life. You know, you're going to have to completely replace your entire wardrobe, likely many people do. Um, and periods of intense change are always very hard. You have to worry about if people are going to be respectful of you, even if you're in a good situation where everyone is trying to be respectful of you, which isn't always the case, um, it can still be really hard. And the wardrobe is kind of the first one I was going to talk about. A lot of trans people have a lot of baggage about what kind of clothes they're going to wear. Um, and that can make navigating business casual very difficult. Um, if you have to replace your whole wardrobe when you first come out, um, you know, that's really tough and probably not a thing that happens all at once. So you're replacing clothes over time, um, which means that newly out trans people often like don't have a ton of clothes, which can also make dressing like hard and stressful and there's just emotional baggage about it. Um, same about using bathrooms. Um, it's really tough to explain how stressful it is to use bathrooms, public bathrooms as a trans person. Um, I don't really have time to actually go into all the reasons for that right now, um, but I'm sure you have kind of an idea. You know, you hear about like bathroom bills and stuff on the news, so that's all, you know, related to that baggage. Um, I'm going to link a talk at the end uh, about, specifically about how to support trans coworkers, and it'll go into that kind of stuff. Um, but basically, please just let me use the gender neutral bathroom in my own home. That's the least stressful way to deal with this for me. And like, it makes you feel self-conscious about your appearance. Like being trans does that in general for a lot of people. And like transitioning also like often comes with awkward teenage phases where it can feel very uncomfortable to be seen, um, especially if you're on hormones. So it can be a relief to turn off your video on a day where you're feeling very self-conscious about that. Um, some people, you know, also it's very important to them to keep their transition private and this helps keep it more private. Like there are some people, I've been pretty open with my transition, but some people like rightly just want to kind of go withdraw into a cocoon and then emerge when they're feeling better about themselves, which I totally get. People have to learn your new name and pronouns when you're first coming out and uh, even well-meaning coworkers are going to sometimes mess up, especially at first. Um, it's, I think it's easier to practice and get it right over like text-based communication um, because then you can be like more thoughtful and catching yourself before you say the wrong thing. Uh, for instance, the company I used to work at, everyone was really respectful and on Slack everyone got my pronouns right like 100% of the time. Um, but then when we had in-person in meetups, people would slip up and um, it was really tough for me because they were trying but it just like made me feel bad and I wanted to have a good time at these meetups and it made it harder. Um, additionally, correcting people is like when they get it wrong can be very anxiety inducing. It's much easier to do that over text subtly, um, send someone a message than having to like speak up in person. Not all trans people have surgeries, but um, many of us do. I had surgery a couple of years ago and I was worried about um, having enough sick time because they told me it was going to be a pretty long recovery period. Uh, but I ended up taking a lot less time off of work than I thought because um, I was kind of bedridden, but like I, my mind was working and I could work right from my bed, so that was really convenient. And uh, also people didn't have to like see me while I was recovering, which took a lot of stress off. So we've talked a lot about the benefits of remote work, um, but there are cons of remote work too. Um, there are already a lot of articles and talks they kind of go into some of those challenges of remote work and give tips for working effectively remote. 
Um, now there's uh, the market is pretty much flooded with them since we've all been in this situation recently. A lot of people that are already good at remote work want to like help support people that are brand new to it, which I think, you know, is cool and, and nice of the community. Um, but actually the phrase already good at remote work is kind of key to what I want to get into here, which is that like there's this remote mindset that you have to get into. It's not always easy. It takes work. Um, remote work doesn't come naturally to any, everyone. It's a skill that takes practice, and you can practice and get better at it, like any skill. And a healthy re remote environment doesn't just happen. It's something that you have to be intentional about and create on purpose. So let's talk about a few ways to do that. Text-based communication for me is a really big one. Uh, not all communications for remote workers is via text, but naturally a lot of it is. And text-based communication is very different uh, than in-person communication. So I'm gonna talk about a bunch of things in this slide. These are kind of tips that would probably be helpful for anybody, um, but that will particularly help people like me who struggle with mental illness. Uh, so here's some of the pros of text-based communication. You can go back and read messages again later. Uh, one of my anxiety symptoms is memory lapses. Uh, so it's really helpful to be able to go back and review exactly what people said later, and then I remember it and the exact context and nuance. It also gives you more time to think about what you're gonna say. You know, being put on the spot, um, particularly with questions, is anxiety inducing. Also, um, async culture helps with that. Even if someone needs an answer kind of like right now and not later, it still gives you just a little bit more time to process and like think about how I'm gonna word what I wanna answer. Uh, but here are some of the cons, I guess, of text-based communication. You know, tone is really hard to convey over text and my anxiety does make me worry a lot about tone and I read into people's words and like text-based communication exacerbates that. You have to be more explicit about your expectations. Um, I would say to err on the side of over communicating if you have to. You know, please tell me explicitly if your request is urgent or non-urgent, particularly if it's after work hours. And like, don't be afraid to cl just clarify your tone, even if that feels awkward. Like, it sounds kind of silly, but emojis help me a lot with this. Um, they can really kind of put some nuance in how to take what you've written. Um, we had an emoji at my old work slack. Uh, I couldn't find the emoji, but it was WYC, which stands for when you can. This was actually um, something that my dad and I had come up with together, I guess, because he used to have a tendency of texting me and being like, call me. Uh, and I would get really nervous about that. I'd be like, why do I have to call him? What is this about? You know, what happened? And I would get really, really anxious. And then I would call him and he would tell me like a funny story or something. And so we developed when you can, W-Y-C is like a text thing so that he could tell me, basically express to me, you know, I wanna talk to you, but like not about something important, just when you can. And so we started using that at my old job and it was like helpful for everybody. And with that in mind, giving as much context as you can um, can really help too. Like if someone is like, hey, can you hop on a call with me right now? I, it spikes my anxiety really bad. You know, what, what happened? What is it about? Is it urgent? Am I in trouble? Did something bad happen? Um, and I'll find like a thousand ways to read into that. So, you know, it only takes a few seconds more to say something more like, hey, can you hop on a call right now? It's time sensitive, but not an emergency. It's relating to this certain project. And that takes away all of that kind of anxiety so I can get on that call and be ready to talk about it and not freaking out about it. Uh, I think the first step to being a good advocate is getting like a sense of the perspectives of other people. Um, so I think that like listening to this talk is maybe a good first step, um, but I do have some like actionable things I wanna talk about. And one of them is this idea of like a remote first culture. Honestly, I think remote works best when you have a whole team that's all remote, but that's not always the case and it can't always be the case. But you still can have this idea of like remote first and like prioritizing and valuing the fact that you have a remote team rather than being like, you know, oh, I guess we can have a remote person for the right candidate or whatever, which is kind of a warning sign. Um, because when some people are remote and others aren't, the remote people miss out on conversations that happen like naturally in person. 
Sometimes that just means like socially, um, the remote person might not get to know their coworkers as well. That's kind of hard to avoid. Uh, but sometimes that means that they might get passed over for opportunities at work. Um, that's something that underrepresented people already have a hard time with. Sometimes they might even, people might get left out of conversations even relevant to projects that they're on because people just want to talk about it when they think of it. Um, and that makes it hard to do your best work and like be heard on your team, which is also something underrepresented people already struggle with. Um, and remote work can make it worse if it's done wrong. So one thing that's really simple but really huge is just if you notice like a conversation happening that's excluding someone who's remote, just say something. You know, oh, you know what? We should probably include Jamie on this because they're working on this project too. Uh, let's put a pin on this and come back to it when Jamie can be part of the conversation. That kind of thing goes a long way. Uh, this one might be like a pet peeve of mine specifically, but I'm sure that this bothers other people too. But I hate being on video calls where there's like a bunch of people who are together in a room and they have one video for that. And then like there's a couple of remote people that called in. It is impossible to keep up with the conversation in that room. Um, there's lag, there's noise, I can't make speak up and be heard. It makes me feel so left out. It makes me feel more left out than just like not being included in a conversation at all. Uh, so at my last company we talked about this and we decided that like everyone should phone in to video calls individually. So people who are in the office, even though they're in the same room, all like took out their laptops, put on their headphones, and called in individually. And that made it feel, even though they weren't remote, it made it feel more like a remote call and meeting and like put everyone on the same playing ground, like level playing ground, I guess. Uh, like I said, it's not possible to cover all microaggressions that you might see. Um, but just in general, a really good way to support underrepresented people in an office is to identify microaggressions so that A, you can not do them, and B, you can stop other people when they do them. Um, so again, I'm just going to talk about a couple here um, that were relevant to some of the specific things I've already touched on. Please don't comment on people's appearance on video calls. I'm not talking about like, you know, oh, I like your new haircut. But people will sometimes say stuff like, oh, you look under the weather. Please don't. If someone looks under the weather, maybe they look tired, maybe they're going through some awkward acne, maybe they're disheveled and wearing their pajamas, please just don't say anything. It's easy and it costs zero dollars to not say anything and it will make people uncomfortable if you do. Um, and related to that, allow people to keep their video off sometimes. Um, a lot of places push for everyone having video on during calls. And I get that. I think there's value to that. It really does foster um, more of a, a relationship between coworkers. I've done this both ways, and audio only just doesn't kind of make you feel like you're a team and friends the same way. Um, but if someone has to keep their video off, like occasionally or sometimes, there's probably a reason that they're doing that. Um, so I would try to just let that happen and not make people feel weird about it. This is a really big one for me. Um, correct pronouns and correct name are not, is not something that you should just do when you're with somebody. Um, you should be doing that all the time. Um, and especially if there are people in person in an office and then a trans worker is remote, like this is how I've experienced. I like get a lot of anxiety wondering if I'm being misgendered in the office where I can't hear it um, when I'm not there. And so, I worry about that, and I've even talked to my coworkers about that. Um, so don't let that happen. You know, it's disrespectful, and it's also bad practice for when you are with that person, and then you're going to mess up in front of them and make them feel even worse. Um, the caveat with this is I would talk to someone about doing this. Some people are uh, uncomfortable with the idea of other people correcting people on their pronouns and such, um, but I think most people would appreciate this. Okay, so I would be remiss if I didn't talk about working remotely in the situation that we're in right now directly. Uh, I wrote this proposal and got it accepted at RailsConf and started writing this talk um, quite a few months ago before I or the general public, I think, were really aware of COVID-19 and did not have any idea what kind of situation we were going to be in. 
Um, but it's kind of a big thing now. A lot of people are working from home for the first time. Um, and to those people, I say, welcome to the club. Uh, please let us help you. Please let us give you tips. A lot of people want to do that, as I mentioned earlier. Um, but I think in some ways, actually, this is a pretty huge revolution. Uh, there have been a lot of people advocating for remote work, talking about all the reasons that remote work would help them, like I've been talking about. And a lot of people's companies are just like, no, you know, we can't. We can't support remote work. We're not going to do it. And I think that we obviously can. We're seeing now. It's hard, but we can. And I think this is a bit of a Pandora's box situation because um, even though this is a tough situation that we're in right now, I think it's going to be really hard after it's done to tell some of those people who had been wanting remote accommodations, like, no, we're going back so we can't. Um, I think it's going to be hard to put that back in the box. So we're kind of in a new world now. Um, but on the other hand, you have a lot of people who are working from home for the first time and saying, like, this sucks. And you know what? You're right. It totally sucks. Um, the Becoming remote only in the middle of this COVID-19 thing is like not a healthy remote environment like I was talking about earlier. Like it has to be intentional. You have to work at it. And we were all kind of just thrown into this. And there's tons of factors. Um, you're not normally under the stress of living in this world in a pandemic. You're not normally stuck in your house all the time. Maybe with like your spouse who also can't go to work or your kids who can't go to school and everyone is distracting you. Um, this isn't what remote work is normally like. And I want to assure everyone of that because I'm hoping that we can push towards remote work long term. But like, I don't want to see a whole bunch of people being like, nope, I tried it and it was awful. This does not count as trying it. <laughs> it, can, it can be so much better than this when you're doing it in the right situation. And like, it makes me think about the future. Um, like, how is this going to look after maybe some of this situation dies down. Um, and it's really hard to speculate about the future right now since, gosh dang it, we just have no idea what the world is going to be like in a few months. Um, but I do think that while we're in a tough situation right now, we have the power, I guess, to let it change the landscape in ways that are exciting and that will help a lot of people long term by integrating remote work as a more standard part of our lives. And ultimately, I think if we can find a silver lining and use some of this bad situation to make people's lives better in the future, we it's our responsibility to do that. And I'm hopeful that we will be able to. I did say that I would re recommend a few videos. Um, Understanding Spoon Theory and Preventing Burnout is a talk of my own from RailsConf 2017. It was my first RailsConf talk, actually. Um, it's pretty personal <laughs> also, um, but I hope that you could get something out of it. Um, Things I Wish I Knew Before Going Remote, remote that's a talk from RailsConf 2019 by Marla Zasheen. Um, like I said, there's a lot of talks. This is a pretty... Uh, pretty well-trod topic, but I liked this talk, um, so I'm recommending it. And then Trans Eye for the Cis Ally, also from RailsConf 2019. Uh, Julian Fitzpatrick did this talk about ways to uh, be a good coworker and advocate for um, trans people that you might work with. Really um, informative and helpful talk, and Julian was also my track organizer for RailsConf this year. Um, this talk was supposed to be part of Julian soft skills track, which was really exciting. Um, so I want to shout out to them, and I hope that maybe some of the other people from our track also put out their videos um, because it looked like some really good talks. So maybe you can emulate this track experience at home. But seriously, thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this. Um, it makes me feel connected to the Rails community that we are still able to kind of put this on as best we can and put out content while we're in quarantine. Um, you can find me on Twitter at jamiebash. jamiebash.com is my website, has my email on there. Um, normally when I do a talk live, I get a lot of feedback from people, um, and I'm not really getting that, and that means a lot to me. So actually, it would really, I would really appreciate it um, if you liked this talk, if you have thoughts about this talk, reach out to me. 
Um, if you liked it, tweet about it to your friends. Um, just tell me what you thought. It would really mean a lot to me to get some feedback from you in that way. Um, but other than that, stay safe, stay healthy. The Rails community is really important to me, so please, please, everyone stay safe and healthy. Um, and I'll see you at the next one as soon as I can. Thank you.